probably the best way to kick this off is to talk a little bit about how this chat got set up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is very um, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of, I think I nerd sniped you uh, a little bit. <laughs> um, so, little but bit. but essentially, essentially, like obviously, I've I've known I've known about you know your work for for a while. It's, I'm just like it's I'm not in that field. Like I'm I'm a primarily yeah. front end JavaScript type person. Um, and uh, I was just listening, like, but I do keep an eye out, right, of like stuff that's adjacent to me. Uh, and I was listening to the AWS podcast, and then they were like trying to frame observability. Uh, with like the three pillars and stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, and I, I thought that was that was what it was, and I was like, okay, this is insightful. Insightful. I think there's some tools that translate to that in my world, yeah. so I'm just gonna like write them down. Um, mm-hmm. And that was my blog post for the day. And you made a great and- blog post. It was a great <laughs> blog post. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I used the wrong word. I said observability in the title, uh, and uh, of course, whenever you mention observability on the internet, you show up. Um, and, and, well, what, and, uh, so one of my friends pinged me and was like, so there's this guy who just wrote this blog post and he's great. So you should be, be nice to him, but he might appreciate it if like you shared with him some of some other definitions. And so I went and I read it and I was like, ah, oh, this is a great blog post, but it has nothing to do with observability. So I, I tweeted at you like 30 or 40 tweets, I think. <laughs> it's like, great. Uh, yeah. Like, um, you know, you're, uh, Something that people know know me for is that I, I don't mind being corrected on online, right? Like uh, that's how that's how people learn. Um, and also, yeah. it's it's a it's a law of the internet. You know that there's that XKCD cartoon where it's I think it's called Cunningham's law. Like if someone's wrong on the internet, you just have this like urge to correct yes. them and like yes, just, no, you, like you know I can't um, come to bed. Someone is wrong on the internet. <laughs> but it's it's a little bit like what makes Twitter great, which is yeah. like every like people's you know are at experts at their field and they kind of interact with each other and they can they can really sort of correct each other in real. Time. and it really does like it's low it's how friction. We all get better it yeah. is it's and, like and friction learn. that polishes us right <laughs> nice <laughs> that polish and uh yeah I, I like i like that i like that um so yeah in in the in the vein of you know polishing uh i did i did go i did follow up and read up and uh and watch the emily's talk which I, which i'm also going to link uh on at olicon which like by the way i had not heard of ollie as a uh concatenation uh until i waited accidentally waited into this field i have mixed yeah. feelings about this <laughs> i know i know but it's so cute it's so cute <laughs> i'm sure there's a mascot or something waiting in the wings there really um, should be <laughs> yeah. uh yeah okay so so i i figured what what uh, what, I'm, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about definitions and then we're gonna we're gonna uh, i have prepared some questions about like the nuances about applying this idea to the front end um mm-hmm. and then we we'll just talk about whatever comes up at the, uh, towards the end. Yeah. Oh, that sounds that sounds good. Uh, um, yeah. So okay. So definitions. Um, uh, and I mean, I'm sure I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts about definitions. Uh, what you said in in your in your tweet storm, which is awesome, um, which is uh, observability is about understanding what's happening inside the system. Um, uh, being able, the ability to ask any question of your systems to understand any user or user behavior or subjective experience without having to predict the questions in advance. Uh, observability is about unknown unknowns, um, yeah. and yeah, that that's that's a pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's you know it's all of our all of our tools like up until very recently have been oriented around helping us you know ask questions that we could predict in advance. You know. Um, like whenever you're setting up a metric, you have to decide which metrics to gather, which custom metrics to define, which which each metric is a question, right? It's like saying, measure this one particular thing for me. Um, and the tools that we have do this quite well. And and for a long time, like you could, like as a backend engineer, I could build a system, look at it, size it up, predict 80% of the ways it was going to fail, right? Connections are going to fill up, something's going to time out. Something's going to run out of capacity. You know, I could predict those things. I could write monitoring checks for them. And then I could just, like, configure my system to just check it and make sure that it's within the thresholds that I've defined. And I would need to tweak those thresholds from time to time. Once in a while, you know, a new thing would come up and I'd need to, like, define a new check. But, like, the system would be pretty stable. Like, that worked really well for a really long time. And, and partly because you had the app, right? The monolithic app. And you had the database. Like, the... Hey, Christine, can I call you back? <laughs> Thanks. I'm on a conversation podcasting thing. I'll talk to you in a few <laughs> Oh. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, like, honestly, it worked because, you know, most of the complexity, the new questions that you had to ask 
they all came up inside that the app, right? And so you'd need to attach a debugger or you'd need to, you know, it would be contained within that process. Well, what happened when we had microservices is that process got blown up, right? Now the process comes in and it hits a service and another service and another service and another service and you lose all the context because there, there's like five or 20 different processes, right? Uh, and so suddenly all the complexity of the apps functioning is exposed to um, the outside. And now, now suddenly like you can't predict all the questions you're gonna to need to ask if you ever could, like arguably you couldn't do we were just kind of hacking along but you definitely can't now. Like there, the proliferation of, like everything's a high cardinality dimension, right? The number of clients, the number of versions for each client, the number of devices, the number of services, the you know, number of databases and storage types. See, like every single one of those things needs to combine with each other, like dynamically. You can't predict if, you know, if, you know, you're getting a spike of errors, what's it gonna be? Well, usually it's like half a dozen things, right? So it could be a particular version, combined with a particular version on the back end, combined with a particular language, combined with a particular region, combined with a particular, you know, like it just all of these things. And you can't predict all those questions that you're going to need to ask in advance. I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think that that makes a lot of sense for me. I, I especially, especially think about um, we've, so we've had production outage, outages at where I work. Um, and uh, sometimes like we, we might set up, like, and I'm not commenting about where I work specifically. I'm, I'm just saying like, where we've had failures before, we would sometimes set up a metric afterwards to yeah. monitor that, that watch for that particular thing. But then it never happens again because we fixed it. Yes. And then it just... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You're fighting the last battle and it's, it's so always weird. fighting the last battle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so for that, a long time, it worked pretty well because, you know, it, it would, the same things would happen over and over again. Like history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, you know? Yeah. And increasingly, I think every time you get paged, it should be something new. Right, something you've never seen before. Because if it, if if you've seen it, then you fix it, and it doesn't happen again. Right, it's a completely different paradigm. Yeah, um, I did also want to ask about. So you you mentioned you touched a little bit on how um, we we went from Olive to like the distributed system type of thing, and obviously distributed tracing is is part of the lexicon of what people talk yeah. about with with, uh, with regards to metrics logs and traces. Um, you you said in the tweet storm that now we're getting closer. Tracing is absolutely key to observability, but it's just one way of visualizing events by time. Um, could you expand a little bit yeah. on that? Totally. So, you know, tracing is just, is, is just like a waterfall visualization of events, right? It's just applying a time so that you can, which is really powerful because sometimes, you know, it, it, sometimes things are much more clear when you're visualizing them than when you're just like reading lines. But a thing that we realized when we were building Honeycomb, and Honeycomb is just an event store in the beginning. You know, you could slice and dice, you could like, you know, you could ask any question, everything, but, and then there was a moment when we kind of went, oh, these are just spans. Like each of these, if we just like append a certain, you know, a trace ID um, and, and, you know, the, 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 the incrementing values, uh, then we can, we can visualize them using the data that we already have. And so we built, you know, trace capabilities into Honeycomb. And then we started realizing, oh shit, these tracing capabilities, uh, there, it's not just about a process, it's not just about a request. We can apply them in lots of other ways. Like we can visualize the, pro the progress of our CICD pipelines using traces, right? Like anything that happens um, it, in time, uh, it can be useful to apply a tracing lens to it. So I think that tracing is simultaneously um, not as big of a deal because it should be just part of, you know, part of the normal package and a way bigger deal because it should be applicable to everything. And this is why I think the metrics logs and traces framing is actively going to hold us back if we adopt it. Because um, if we say metric, you know, observe really about metrics logs and traces, um, we're saying that it's just these three data types, basically. And you have them, you've got observability. And first of all, metrics are often irrelevant or an obstacle to observability because they require you to pre-aggregate or to define what the questions are before you ever write that out to disk, right? Like when a, when a request is coming in through the, you know, when a request comes in the front door and it's, you know, bouncing around through the services, uh, the way that you gather metrics in the old, you know, the SATSE term is, is they're all disconnected from each other. You've lost that connective, you know, the connective tissue of the request ID because you've just like, you, you maybe have captured like 300 metrics, but you can never reassemble them, which means you can't ask new questions of them. You can't recombine them. You can't say, oh, there's a spike in this metric. What else? 
what do those things have in common, right? You can't ask the yeah. questions in that direction. And logs are just, logs are just like the trash heap of, of data. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, they can be very good if they're structured in the right way. But most of the connotations we have with logs is they're strings. Their output are just like fired off willy nilly throughout the Azure process is executing with no discipline, with no width to them, you know, and so they're going to harm you in your observability efforts too. Um, traces are very valuable, but again, tracing is just kind of like um, what you should get after you've done the right things. It's not how you gather the data. Um, and like, I think that what is meaningful to you as an engineer is what you can do with the data. It's the questions you can ask. It's the problems you can solve. You should not have to give a fuck what, what, what data type was, you know, and it's even worse than that because if you're like, okay, it's, it's, you know, metrics, logs, and traces. Well, the big vendors out there, they're saying, okay, pay to store this data three times. Pay us three times so that you can ask questions over here, over here, and over here. Meanwhile, your human's going to be sitting there in the middle copy-pasting IDs from one to the other to try and knit them together to make any sense of them, which is incredibly wasteful and expensive. And you've still got someone in there who's, who's like being a monkey, just like copy paste that over there, now trace it, you know, and that's insane. Like it should be, tracing an event should be two sides of the same coin where you just flip back and forth fluidly, you know, just like, you know, oh, there's a spike. I want to understand it. You go slice down. Oh, that's what it is. Show me how you, now trace it. Show me, is that valuable? You know, show me how you trace it. Once you find the problem in the trace, zoom back out and see who else is impacted by this? Who else is experiencing this, Right. You can't do that if you've, if you've torn, <laughs> torn the problem apart and you're stored pieces of it in three different locations, right? So like the, to get kind of back end nerdy for you, uh, all of those big, you know, whether it's Datadog, New Relics, Splunks, they are all trying to desperately to come technically to, to the place that Honeycomb sits right now. And they're trying to do that faster than we can grow the business side up to where they are now. But like the way that you solve this in the back end is you want to gather arbitrarily wide structured events, one per service per request. And you want to, in, in, you know, auto append the, the stuff that will let you, you know, create spans and traces out of it. Um, but, but then you have that one and arbitrarily wide. The reason it needs to be arbitrarily wide is because you can't have a predefined schema that locks people into only sending certain dimensions because then it's another version of having to predict what data you're going to need, right? You need to let people toss in, any information that might be valuable at any time, right? So, and like we find that mature instrumented services will have like 400, maybe 300 to 500 of um, your, your, each event will be 300 to 500 dimensions wide. So that's like 300 to 500 things that describe every single event, um, which means that when you see a spike of errors, you can, you would correlate any combination of all of those things that you, that you gather, right? Which is incredibly powerful. And, and now it's, it's kind of like we've taken the debugger that you used to attach to a trace and, and we've like, this is kind of like, you're kind of like debugging a process as it jumps from service to service, right? You can kind of see the parallels there. Um, it's, it's just the next generation of that. It, it does lead to um, one, one, one thing I saw from you, which was the, the trade-offs, which is uh, the observability trade-offs, which I, I can relate is. Uh, you can either pick, you, 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 these are the features that you would want, which are high throughput, yeah. high cardinality, lengthy retention window, um, unsampled or sampled, and reasonable cost, which I yeah. put as the, as the fifth mm -hmm. one. Um, and totally. it seems like people have to trade off uh, sampling uh, as, as one of the, the typical ones, so and retention. People are afraid of sampling for mostly bad reasons. And it's mostly because of the marketing that, you know, the log vendors have been like, keep every log line. It's very important. And like, it's super we hot. Like, profit from that. <laughs> exactly. You know, like think about your health checks. Are they as important to you as your errors? They're not, they're nowhere near. You want to know how many there are and you want to know when there's, you know, a general sh change in the, in the volume or the, you know, but you don't care about likewise, like, um, HTTP 200s that hit your root domain those are less valuable to you than like a 500 that hits like slash payments, right? There's a lot of variance there. And like, I think that like what, what, what we're seeing is, you know, you want to give engineers the ability because you know your data. I don't know your data. So anybody who tries to auto sample for you is going to do kind of a dumb job of it. 
but you know what's important to you and what's not. And like, so you can say, okay, these are the endpoints that I want to keep a hundred percent of. These are the request codes that I want to keep a hundred percent of. And then you can mess with the others to control your costs, right? Um, another interesting thing that is the combination of sampling with tracing. Like you absolutely want to sample on a per trace basis, not on a per request basis, because um, you know you you don't want to sample like this service in the trace like 100% of the time and this service 25% of the time and this service 50% um, of the time and have them not yeah. all be the same ones, right? Yeah. So so that's <laughs> sure. an interesting thing, and I think that there's going to be some interesting stuff that gets built in the in the coming couple of years around like automatically detecting when something interesting is starting to happen and capturing hundred percent of all the data, you know, for some short time. And like, this is the kind of stuff that Google has now and nobody else has. Um, yeah. But the bottom line is like, like 80% of what you gather is kind of trash <laughs> and, <laughs> and you can cut your bill in half by, by not even like throwing away something that you might want someday it's just learning to think critically about what you do want and what you don't and looking at the health check type stuff. And, you know. Anyway, you can either sample or you can pre-aggregate. Nobody's going to pay for an observability stack that costs five times as much as production, right? So, yeah. and, and if you're pre-aggregating, then you can never ask new questions because you're locked into the questions that you cho chose to ask when you, when you wrote them out. So a, a form of sampling is pretty much an absolute necessity at some point but for a lot of people it's a lot farther out than they think they can just be wasteful for a, a long time without it being very expensive cool that uh, more of an optimization step yeah uh, it's an optimization when you're big and you need to care about it you'll know cool um so i, I guess i guess we'll go into like the more front endy uh you know kind of yeah. link these link these ideas and uh I, I, of course I, I i respect that you know you, you haven't thought as much of uh, as deeply about this as, as maybe some I don't, other, I'm not other a front-end engineer, so I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, we'll yeah, I'm going to try, try and like, link it out. with you, check stuff with you, get your first reactions, um, totally. what, what, what have you. Um, and a, a lot of this, I'm going to link to uh, Emily uh, Nakashima, yeah, her, her talk at yeah. Um And so the, the first thing I think when it comes to embracing uh, events and observability is like defining what an event is because for, yeah. I think for a backend, one request or one unit of work is 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 a clearly defined unit, um, mm -hmm. but in 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 the front end, like that has a lot of different sections. Mm -hmm. um, so Emily Emily identified uh, she had a few. She had on page load, on page navigation, on, on client side, on significant user actions, on error, and on page unload. And she and she said that maybe she wanted to. And this is stuff this stuff that you actually did right at at Honeycomb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe she wanted to combine load and unload together. Um, so, so like I, I think I think. Uh, like first of all, any any reactions to that? Like any 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 anything else that you might add? If family said it, then I endorse it. <laughs> <laughs> I, really, I think I think no, just like understanding right. understanding what like uh, that's a big bucket on significant user action um, is like just like blah like everything that yeah. <laughs> that's interesting yeah. in your app. Um, totally. The the thing that the thing that I don't understand. So uh, actually, maybe maybe I'll ask this like. Uh, is there one ID that just like just, like just goes through for one single user's session, or is each of these a separate event ID? That's a great question. I feel like I should be asking you that though. <laughs> like, how do you how do you track sessions? Is there a, se a session ID? Like, there is, right? Um, uh, it's. I mean, you'd have to you'd have to define what that means for you because a lot of times, like uh, some people, for example, they'll they'll say like if you use. Uh, the app, or if you do an action within 30 minutes of each other, that's the same session, and you kind of have to like retros mm. retroactively join them together. Gotcha. Uh, but but if you step away for five hours and come back, that's a different session, and like, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, and and you just have to figure it out. Yeah. Just, uh, after the fact. To me, I feel like a window of a, a smaller window than that makes a little bit more sense to me because it, like, I would think of it in terms of what should I want to trace, right? Because I might want to look for in a, in a, in a, in a, in a trace view. Um, so like a window of 10 minutes seems kind of like a maximum to me. Sure. I, I, I maybe I, I, I went, I went too far 30 minutes, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Like a, a, a smaller, smaller window. Um, and yeah. then, and then I think like, you know, uh, obviously I think this is well understood for marketing. Like, um, you know, have you clicked the call to action? Have you like signed up, yeah. you know, based on the landing page and we measure our funnel that way. We, we like, we have this down to science for marketing, but I think yeah. for in-app, um, stuff where we under where we try to understand users user actions 
um, we're not really that scientific about it. We <laughs> just kind of go yeah. by the design and, and, and what have yeah. you. But, uh, but it'd, be, it'd be interesting to like define events. But I, I think, I, I feel like so... It you know, really what, would. What we, what we, so I, that's a little bit of a tension for me uh, with, like, with metrics being, we, we, don't, we don't like metrics because we have to predefine them. But yeah. with events, we kind of have to predefine them. Um, you do need and, to think a little bit upfront around how you're going to be using it. And I see this as a good thing. Because I yeah. feel like there's so much value in thinking about your future self or your team who is trying to come along and make sense of whatever your code has emitted, right? And I feel like it's, a, it's an affirmatively good thing to force us to do that a little bit um, and to think about what is going to be useful for the future me at 2 a.m. who's trying to understand this, right? Yeah. Like, like collaboration, like a lot of times we think about collaboration as being with other people, but it's just as much like you collaborating with your future self and your past self, right? Like, because the current, you know, whatever original intent you have in your head right now, it's just going to be gone, right? And so I feel like it's, it's good if it forces us just to think a little bit about how it's going to be consumed. And I think that there's, there's flexibility here. You know, there isn't really a, a, an answer, like capital A, so much as there is a way that you're going to be using the data that makes sense. Gotcha. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, and yeah, and I, I guess that's we'll we'll have to we'll have to figure that out, you know, and, and over yeah. with experience. I, I I'm just, super I just, I feel like interested in that answer. I've never been trained to do this. It's just. Uh, oh, honey, nobody know. has. <laughs> <laughs> nobody has. We're all making it up as we go. <laughs> um, uh, look, uh, actually, actually, I'm just I'm going to share my screen, and uh, we're actually we'll, we'll actually talk about like the stuff that uh, Emily suggested we track, uh, which I thought I thought this is very very helpful because yeah. I I'm a I'm a very concrete person, and I need examples, right? So, yeah. for example, um, we, we we talked about the events. Uh, we talked uh, rail is another thing that uh, apparently Honeycomb does load and uh, responsive as well. Uh, yeah, the other the other two are less important. So yeah that makes sense or less important in the sense that like we can use browser tools to check them we don't need yeah. any for that um uh, things to send uh this is interesting right because now, now we're talking about flushing out uh, fleshing out the full uh wide uh store we have page yeah. type user id a b testing groups uh performance stuff uh and capabilities this is the easiest i think i think everyone uh, collects this mm -hmm. um I, I had a I had a fun one like Zoom level like to to maybe tell you if like your font's too small. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, online online offline status. This one is a tricky one. So because people can go online and offline yeah. or have a flaky and uh, weird connection. Um, yeah. And Rachel Rachel had the uh, edit duration second, which is awesome. Um, so, so these so this is an idea of like custom metrics, right? The the thing we work backwards from the thing that we want, which is people building queries quickly. And then, so and then we get to... I can actually show you if you want to yeah. see what that looks like in Honeycomb oh, on our side. All right. Uh, over, yeah. over to you. <laughs> I like this. This is like screen sharing with like you know, real, totally. real stuff. It's awesome. <laughs> Let's see. Share. Share my screen. The green share. Uh, and this is a uh, data set that I, I can't remember ever looking at. So I see it. You see it? Okay. Yeah. So this is this is user events, and over here on the right, you can see this is all the stuff that we capture in production nice. for Honeycomb for wow, every like, single event. It's like four, two hundred. That's years. like a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a I'm, lot of stuff there. Um, yeah, I, I have a question about this, uh, but but yeah. I'll, I'll leave that to later. Um, and at the bottom here, you can see there are derived columns. And these are just ones that we compute on the fly based on things that we've gathered, right? Cool. Um, and because I don't ever use this data set, I'm going to look at the team history. These are things that, these are queries that people on the team have. Oh, that's awesome. Recently. You can just look over their shoulder. Right? Right. <laughs> so it's very useful for, for people like me. Um, there's some stuff. Let's see. Type names query. So it's like Molly was looking for all the events that, that contain the... Um, Query stuff. Um, let's see what would be useful. Um, I can show you. This is what a. These are what the raw events look like. And that finishes loading. So, you can see how wide they are. <laughs> Gather yep. all this stuff. Um, and let's see. Let's look at. Christine was looking at this. This, this is just like the um, the duration of trace parent ID does not exist. So this is a 
she's looking at a heat map of all of the queries that do not have trace parent IDs. Um, let's find one. So here's a, here's a, this is a interesting one. Um, and if we were going to look at, so one of the most interesting things that you can do with Honeycomb is, so if I see a spike or something that I want to understand, like here's a spike, I want to understand it. I can just draw a, uh, draw a square around it. My, my browser is, needs to be restarted. Um, I can just draw, all right, around the heat map. If I draw a square around the thing that I want to understand, then we pre-compute, like for all the dimensions, for all the terms of dimensions, we compute the difference between what's inside the bubble and what's outside, and then we sort them. So you can see, like, this is what's different like, about these, right? So you can just okay. automatically see those were different in these ways. These are the ones that, um, yeah. And then I can, um, I can just, uh, I, I can go like and just like trace based on that by, by going like, uh, show me a trace for that one. So here's like the page load. And then there's a lot going on there. There's your <laughs> request out. Uh, this is a pretty complicated request, but you get the gist, right? Like, yeah. This um, is the waterfall. This is the waterfall. This is everything that happened on that page load for 50, 60 seconds. And you can see why I was saying that it should be a shorter time frame than 30 minutes because this would this is like for under a minute. <laughs> right. It gets very long, long and and like interesting. So and these these like vertical lines here, these are all deploys. Each one of these is a deploy. How much this is over this is over a two two week period. So that's a lot of data there. But yeah, is that helpful? Yeah, totally. Um, so are these events? So so these are these are actually things uh, being sent from somebody. This is running. this is our production system. Yeah, um, we dog food everything. Yeah, yeah that's um, and you name all your services dogs, which was a fantastic fact that I. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I enjoyed. Well, the first Honeycomb's first name was we were we were called Hound was our our first. Uh, wow. Name and then we got a cease and desist from um, from Hound CI, and I'm trying to figure out how to go I've, back to my video. I don't even know what what they are. Um, Hound CI is a Ruby thing, <laughs> and uh, so we were like, "Oh shit, what are we going to name ourselves?" And we sat down with the viewers and we like did brainstorming and and uh, and came up with Honeycomb. But of course, all the domains were taken, but they were owned by Stuart from who's Slack. the CEO of Slack. And uh, we went and asked, can we have honeycomb.io? And they gave it to us for just the cost of the lawyer's fees to transfer it. They gave us honeycomb.io and hny.co as is, is a shortener too. So it was very sweet. Oh, yes, that's all, awesome. the, all of the services are named after dogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's really cute. Um, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, I think that's, that's really effective, especially the, the, the interaction between just drawing over um, those like you know anomalies that you want to study and Isn't then having amazing? like a true like, false and, and that thing. being able to draw and just jump to it like that what that replaces is the the loop of you know formulating a guess oh I, I think it might be this domain and like typing it in and graphing by it and going oh nope it wasn't that one let me try the next you know just doing that over and over and over and like when you have when you when you use the data set for a while, you'll have in, instincts and intuitions, you know, that will often lead you to the right thing. But it still can be time consuming. And when if you're new to the data set, it can take a really long time. And like this is what computers are good at. Like what humans are good at is attaching meaning to things. What computers are good at is chunking through lots and lots and lots of numbers. So like, yes. So, so that that I think is just a killer feature that like it's it's so great. Like if you see a spike, you want to understand it, you draw a blob and you jump straight to the answer every time. It's amazing. It's awesome. Um, okay, front end, uh, more front end MD related questions. Yeah. Um, this seems like you know the the in my in my world this this maps very closely to user research, um, especially uh, the, the story that Rachel Fong was talking about with like um, oh like we actually want to understand the difference between honeycomb employees and non honeycomb employees. And, yeah. 
um, people that don't succeed the way that people who work on a product do, that's a very easy win. Um, and uh, so, so we have like products for that f- uh, full story, hot jar, stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, which where we collect uh, user entire user journeys. Um, do you th- yeah. feel like that's basically you? You use Honeycomb for that, basically. We use Honeycomb for that. We use Honeycomb for everything. So it's it's an interesting question. Like, if you built a tool to do one thing and do it really, really well, it's going to be the best, right? It's going to be the best at that. There's also a lot of power though in just having everyone use the same source of truth right? Mm. We, we have a lot of product managers who love using Honeycomb because they get to use the same data as the engineers do. And then they don't have to spend time arguing about whose view of reality is true, right? Uh, and, and so I'm a big fan of single source. I have a sticker that says, here, I'll show it to you. You have a single source of truth or multiple, <laughs> or multiple of versions of lies. <laughs> yes, multiple <laughs> sources of lies. Um, that pony it, looks very aggressive. <laughs> it's like, it's like it's warning very you. Very aggressive pony. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so like I, I like there's a definitely a big there's there's a there's a place for tools that specialize. Um, but I find that you know engineers and engineering adjacent teams, of which there are so, like whether it's support, whether it's you know, I think there's so much unlocked power in just like opening up production to them so that they can do their jobs better because they have direct access to information. You don't have to be an engineer to use data and to get a lot of, a lot of value and, and like powerful shit out of your data. And I'm really looking forward to building things in the honeycomb that make it easier for, for people who live right adjust, adjacent to production uh, to like self-serve that way. Because I feel like how, how many times like do people end up you know, filing tasks asking engineers to do things for them that really they could do perfectly well themselves, faster, better, right? Because if you just like, if you serve the information up to them so that they don't have to go through an engineer who has to like open a database console, like type something in and then no. paste it into the task, for them, you know, <laughs> all the time. Like, I think that there's a lot, a lot to be done there. That's awesome. Yeah. Which but, kind I mean, of answers your question and kind that. of doesn't. You know, I mean, we're never going to be the best user journey tool, but you can get a lot of the same insights out of it. Well, I mean, you, if you're the source of truth, then I could connect to you instead and yeah. do, do my user research there. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's helpful. Um, there, there, okay, so some questions about like the mechanics of this. Uh, so, uh, in you know, one of the ways in which the front end differs on the back end is that there are device failures and then there's mm-hmm. uh, bandwidth issues. Mm-hmm. So device failures meaning like, I imagine, I think the way Honeycomb works, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, at the end of the session, uh, I, I think you specifically said this, where like, on error or, or on success, you send up the giant blob to, to your Honeycomb server. Mm-hmm. Um, we may not get that far. <laughs> no, totally. So, yeah, and, and that's, that's simplifying on the back end, too. Like, lots of places don't have, like, requests. They're, like, streaming things where you, like, we've written some blog posts on how to just, like, emit pulses periodically, right? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, so so you can like you can capture you can have anything trigger it. Um, it's just the simplest one to explain to people is usually before errors and exits. Okay, okay, that yeah, that makes sense because like it it, it almost is like a it, because then in my mind the best way to implement this as a front end engineer is I would ping Honeycomb or whatever my observability mm-hmm. store is. I get an a event token and mm-hmm. I use that uh, mm-hmm. as far as it as far as it lets me. Um, oh, interesting. And then, and then I'll, I'll every time I send send a piece of information back that's relevant, yeah, yeah. I'll use that token, and it, it just know where to slot idea. it. I'm um, writing that down. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna pass that along. Uh, <laughs> Thank um, well, you. Well, you know, just give me some credit if you, if you actually end up uh, shipping. Oh, for it. sure, uh, I will. We'll be, name be, it after be, you. We'll call it the oh. Swixity. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which I, I I love I love the I love the idea of attaching IDs like I I'm I'm a proponent of like because I see a lot of JavaScript code and a lot of people like to name things very shortly yeah and a lot there's a lot of IDs out there where uh, like we've had we had like an issue where like we had like three different ports and we just like did not name them well so it was like port and then port A and then like right, proxy port right. and, uh, the right. other one was the proxy port and it was just it was just it was just such a bad thing like we should no, just IDs have all are the, the information. Shit. <laughs> like because like IDs are like you know like whenever you're debugging or whenever you're trying to, it's not even about debugging it's about trying to understand your systems right? right whenever you're trying to understand your systems and you have something to start with like yeah. an ID right it's like it's like you're looking for needles in a haystack which is a lot easier if the 
you need to have unique IDs. <laughs> I, find, right? th- this may be this may be a little bit of a detour but do you have opinions on naming uh, of ids like do you do you care about namespacing do you care about like inserting uh, like you know a so username like, in it, there it, it's it's <laughs> it's complicated right I, I do have thoughts and opinions i don't really know that i want to impose on people uh i like prefixes a lot prefixes are really helpful uh right. you know because like it, it helps you partition. It helps people have their own like little area to do stuff in. It's my okay. biggest opinion, wow. I think. Nice. Um, yeah, I, I try to collect opinions. You know, I, I don't. I don't really. I'm not really judgmental, but I think I think we can do mm-hmm. better than uh, 16. For sure. What are your randomly? What randomly are your opinions? Um. Uh. So so I, I have more opinions on naming things. I don't have as much on on IDs specifically, but I'm trying to figure it out because. Look, like um, if we're attaching prefixes, then why can't it just be a separate field? Um, like, right? Like, um, so what are we really doing when we prefix IDs? Uh, so that's 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 the. Well, the, that's it's the all, it's all about, all about the humans, in my in my opinion. Right. If, it's about if making you just it human work readable. On it and you want right. to filter Like it you out. saw the list of of, of naming <laughs> fields that I scrolled through there, right? Having yeah. a prefix that's appended there is nice because it's flexible. Um, you can attach them on the fly, um, and it's not. It's not locking people into anything, but it's giving humans a convention to use. Cool, got it. Um, how about nested events? And can yeah. an event have an, have events? Absolutely, um, absolutely. Does that do we flatten that at some point, or do we just keep it in like a giant uh, event? Event in well, event? I can tell you how we've done it at Honeycomb. But like the the important thing is that you will just allow people to submit the nested events, and that um, and. Like when when you're querying them, like you get really fancy about letting people query, but I feel like keeping it simple is probably the best until you've got, and like most people don't have the problems of scale that that mean that you should do anything fancy with it. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, this is this is very theoretical sense. for me, but <laughs> but you know, like, yeah. Uh, for for like if if my event is a user session, then within that I I may have like using this right. feature, and then within that I may have like click on this button, and then within that you know what, what, what ah I see what you're saying I see what um, you're saying interesting there, yeah I feel like I'm not <laughs> I want to hear the opinions of somebody who knows front end stuff more than me, but I can see what you're talking about for sure yeah okay <laughs> well um you know I think I think I think we're all working through this I think um yeah okay so so for example um I I was. Okay, so there's there's another thing I care kind of a lot about, but don't have a good handle on is online offline syncing. Um, mm. We may have, well, okay, so let's let's say we generate events offline. Of course, we store that, and then whenever we're yeah. online again, we'll we'll send it over. Replay them. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, uh, I I mean I don't know. Like, is that is that the best way? Is is there? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, we then we won't have an, a a token <laughs> from the server. We'll just have to like figure it out, figure one out, stub one out on our own, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my reference point here is the stuff that I remember us working on at Parse uh, for mobile engineers. Like we did the offline stuff, um, and and it's all kind of going to be best effort. <laughs> um, you're right. You can't you can't ask the the server for a token. Um, you know, it's relevant in the back end too because you know sometimes things will go offline and you do want to capture everything and buffer it and replay because often that is the most important data for debugging is the stuff that happened when you couldn't reach the server because sometimes that's when it was in the worst state, right? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to say intelligent about this, intelligently about this, but <laughs> you're right, it's interesting. That, that, that's one of the most challenging because, like, uh, I, you know, these are the these are the things where I. Th- I've been trying to make actually make us make a list of like how does front end engineering differ from back end engineering? Yeah, and, and you have an unreliable, you know. Uh, yeah, to, and to be part, the interesting part here is is how much you expect people to do while they're offline. Like, do you expect them to be able to do full functionality of the app when it's offline, or is it purely an error state? Because I think those are super different. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, like we talked about before, I I I, I, I hope I wish I hope people do more and more stuff offline. Yeah. Um, just because it's faster as well. Um, yeah. I agree, but then, then like it's very different. Like it's, it's like I think that it's the easy case is when it's it's an error. Then you know it's important. You should save it. You should replay it. All this stuff. But you could you could keep using the ID that you got from the server, right? You could just like bunch it all up that way. Versus if you well, you only give me a window. You you only give me a ten minute window. <laughs> well, 
if it's an error, 10 minutes is kind of a long time to be trying sure. something offline. But if you're trying to have the full function of the app, then that's not a long time at all. Like, you know, you're, 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 on, you you're getting always, on a plane, you're in mid-tweet, and then <laughs> you want to continue your tweet story. You, you, you could always take the thing that the server had given you and then, like, append a, like, a, a One, dot two, three, something, yeah. right? Yeah. Because, like, exactly, you could, always, you could always increment in some way, so. Oh, that's intelligent. Okay, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, okay, yeah, um, let's, privacy. Do people, are there issues? That's, that is a really interesting question yes i have um, a lot of information is, yeah in the browser th- this is especially interesting for like people who have healthcare information and, and i'm um, sure you have gdpr concerns as well mm-hmm. yeah because yeah, often the most interesting information will be something like name yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right uh something that you want to be able to search by but isn't you know, so there, there are some things you can do, like you can do, like you can do hashing, you can do like encoding, you can do uh, things that are encrypted so that you have to like do local encryption. Honeycomb has a thing where we, you can run a proxy on your side, stream all the events through it to us. Um, but um, the proxy like stores a mapping of the event to an encrypted representation of the event or stores and crafting or so stores mapping of the event to just the hash and streams just the hash or the encrypted stream to us. And so the keys and everything are only kept behind your secure infrastructure. Um, and that, oh, that so definitely you can works. Tell. Yeah, so cool. we can never decrypt the data. We can never, yeah. you know, get the, get the data. So that's one solution. Um, you know, there are a lot of solutions, but there are a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, you know, who, who, who pays for the compute of un- exactly. <laughs> exactly. unencrypting everything? Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, I, I do, I did, I did think about that. Uh, well, I guess, yeah. The the most naive way I, I think about these things is like all the PII. I would just put it behind yep. like the secure st- store, and then I just have mm-hmm. to deal with user ID as a as a researcher or, or as a programmer. But yeah. yeah, I'm sure I'm sure there's more nuance that I haven't thought about. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of like reaching at the end of my my questions here, but like uh, I I can also kind of just riff. But um, I think just kind of stepping outside, like thinking about how I might sort of implement this in in real life. Um, I, I I've been thinking about this as a, the observability loop. Like, yeah. um, there's there's the there's the obvious case of like when things go wrong, I fire up my uh, observability store and go check stuff. Um, yeah. But but it seems like you 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 don't use that all the time that yes. way. Like, you actually you you go out and look for stuff and yes. ask interesting questions and, and come up with interesting answers so this i'm so glad you asked this because this really yeah. i think this is the most important thing of all like when i was you know growing up <laughs> when i was being taught how to do do this stuff like i was always taught you should not have to stare at your graphs all day you know the system should inform you it should alert you so that you know when you need to go look at it and you know i i i thought that it was it was it was a bad, it was an anti-pattern for you to like look at your graphs unless it was alerting you. And I think that that's really been inverted. I think that now, um, I think people should be looking at their graphs like throughout the day periodically. I think that you should be in constant conversation with your code as users are using it live, because if you aren't looking at your systems when nothing's wrong, you don't actually understand your systems. If you only look at them when things are broken, then you don't actually, you're not actually going to have a good gut feeling for what's, what's working well and when things aren't, you know? Like our systems are now just, they're too complex. You know, we, shouldn't, we should not be paging people on small blips, right? We should be paging people only on, this shit is broken, users are impacted. Because this is how we make on-call into a sustainable thing for engineers, is, is you only, you, you're only in pain when your users are in pain, and that is the law, right? But like in, in exchange, in order to get to that place where you aren't paging yourselves all the time where on call is sustainable, we do have to, we should be, we should be looking at production every day. Every time you ship, you should be, you know, instrumenting your code with the, with the eye to the future, future you who's going to be like, you know, <laughs> asking what does it do? Is it working? You know, and you should be, you should never accept a pull request without being able to explain how will I, how will I know when this is broken, right? And then you should watch your code deploy. And you should be looking at the instrumentation you just shipped, right? Break down on the dimensions that you just put out there and validate, is it working? Is it doing what I expected it to? And does anything else look weird? Because does anything else look weird 
like this to me is what defines a senior engineer. Like it divides a junior engineer from the senior engineers. It's your gut feelings. It's how much I trust them, right? Like you, if, if a senior engineer is like, I can't explain it, but something feels wrong to me. I'm like, I believe you. Let's figure out what, where that's coming from. Don't, don't deny your gut. Right. Um, and junior engineers should follow their curiosity when they, when they're wondering, right? Cause that's the only way that you train your gut. But like, the best engineers that I know would have one window open with their IDE, like writing code, and another window open with their graphs of the shit that they were shipping to production. And they'd just be watching it, you know, in the background and, and playing around with it. And like, you know, and, and, and after seeing that, it's so weird to me now when I see engineers who don't. When I see engineers who like write and ship their code, but only pay attention to the, to the results of their tests, right? Or, or like once it's deployed, it's like, it's out there, you know, I assume someone will let me know if it's broken. Like that Next is ticket. insane. <laughs> Support insane. will tell me. <laughs> you're never going to understand what you're doing if you're not looking at it. You know, like it's, it's this intersection of what's in your head, you know what you, meant, you, what you plan to do. Now, what are your users actually doing? And what is the actual impact of it on your hardware and your infrastructure right like like we should all we should all be looking at production every day and 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 like this is the thing like so many people out there are in so much pain right now because their systems are a piece of shit right like they (laughs) nobody understands it to be honest nobody understands what's happening um, and they're all shipping code daily to these systems that they don't understand. They're just putting more shit they don't understand on top of it. And, and that's why these systems are, are a nightmare. That's why they need to hire separate ops teams and SRE teams and like people to just try and keep a lid on that technical debt because nobody has ever understood it. And this is unnecessary. This is completely, un- this is not just the way it works with software. This is not acceptable. We should have a higher bar for ourselves. Like, but it requires us to be more literate in production. It, pre- it requires us to have all engineers be expected to understand the implications and the effects of what they're shipping. Uh, so in exchange, like I, I know why engineers don't want to go look at prod it's because every time they look at it, it's scary and they find something that's broken and like it's a rabbit hole. Like you start debugging one thing and you run into 10 other things that are broken and so, like, and, and, and the, 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 te- the temptation, to just go oh well, the, so I just won't look <laughs> it will be better if I just don't know right and I get that it's really hard to dig yourself out of this hole it's really hard and one person can't do it right it takes the full commitment of a full team of the whole company um, but life is better this way right life is better if we can follow our curiosity if we can quickly under if you had the confidence if you knew that every time you went to production and you saw something you didn't understand, if you knew you could understand it thoroughly within like 30 seconds, that would be a different kind of, you'd get a dopamine hit from that, right? <laughs> you'd get a hit of brain drugs that, oh, I understand it. Oh, I solved it. Oh, I fixed it. Oh, things are better now. And the, those are the kind of brain drugs that we need to get so that we are, we should be finding problems before users ever run into them, Right. Like if your system is clean and well understood and if you're shipping things you understand and you're making sure you understand what's happening after you ship them, like almost all problems you can catch right there at the point of deployment. When you're looking at it and you're looking through your instrumentation going, is it doing what I expected it to do? Does anything else look weird? You can catch 80 to 90% of all problems right there and your users will never see them and they will never have a chance to like snowball and blow up into things that paid you right like my team doesn't get paid the shit doesn't go down you know it's very rare uh like it's a bad week if somebody gets paid once outside of hours and this is a fast-growing platform with you know chaotic you know user-generated traffic like spikes all over the place and but like we understand it and we look at it every day and if something looks weird we generally catch it pretty quickly. So it's this, it's this, it's this, I'm not trying to minimize what's involved in getting from where m- most people are to, to, to where this is. Um, but it's also something where every little step you take helps. It's not like you have to like climb the mountain to get some elite. No, like every 
piece you understand, every piece of instrument, every piece that is clear and self-explaining, like makes your world a little better and makes your life a little better. And, and I'm just trying to help people understand that there's a better way. So, so, so to answer your question, <laughs> yes. So have it up all the time. Looking, and you should be looking at your code in production every day. Well, um, I wanted to push it a little bit on this because it's like to visualize anything because your, your events are so huge. Um, you can't really see them or visualize them in any same any, to. Any way. Uh, you don't need to. Well, I was just saying like, maybe you're looking at your metrics or your mm-hmm. your monitoring tools and then you use a, your your observability tools sure, that's to, easier for you but like or the thing is that like how does you it, can derive metrics from events you can derive logs from events you can yep. derive traces from events like you can derive all of those we can generate the same graphs as your metrics and monitoring right exactly the same graphs um but if you already have them configured that's fine right like to me, like there's a lot of benefit in having something be right there so you don't have to like jump from tool to tool and then go, oh wait, that spike I was looking at there isn't here. And then you spend all your time like, you know, trying to reconcile the two. Sure. Sure. Um, like our our the default landing spot that you get to when you set up a data set in Honeycomb looks just like a new relic dashboard where you've got requests, errors. Uh, you know, uh, latency, and that's it's it. just it's the data structure. Uh, like it's, like a, a lot of new innovations in 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 computer science. But it starts at the same place, right? It structure. starts. You see, if you're deploying and you see some errors, right? Yep. You can get that anywhere, right? <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, I see. A, so you know, I think we've been talking a lot about like uh, production apps and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I do see a lot of opportunity for doing this in developer tools. Um, yes. Just mainly because I work a lot in in developer tools. Um, and we, uh, the state of JavaScript developer tools is not great. <laughs> like when yeah. stuff goes wrong, I, I don't know how to uh, figure it out. Yeah. I, I don't know. I have, have actually, maybe, maybe I'll open this up to you. Like, have you seen this applied uh, as an idea to developer yes. tools? Yes. Some of the first, some things that I got super excited about came from um, our friends at Intercom who, when they instrumented their, their CI CD pipeline, and I just went, that's fucking brilliant. I hadn't even thought <laughs> of that, but you're right. It's just another trace. Um, like what kind of developer tools do you have in mind? Uh, so at, at uh, Nellify, I mean, um, we, we do a lot with uh, static site generators, uh, mm-hmm. which wrap around Webpack, uh, which, which process, um, you know, complex amounts of transforms from, of JavaScript mm-hmm. and different source files uh, into data and then from data into, into the final build output of mm-hmm. like HTML, CSS, and JS and, um, and, and serverless functions. And any, at any point in time along the way, this chain mm-hmm. of completely untyped code and probably untested code. Right. <laughs> stuff, can, stuff can go wrong. And right. And we don't, we, we, you know, we don't, we find issues. For sure. Um, and and that's, the, that's the foundations on which most of JavaScript is. That should absolutely be instrumented. Yeah. <laughs> That really should be. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> and uh, well, I mean, I I think the nuance for this one is that you need to expose it to your users instead of your, yeah. uh, you know, uh, p- the, the, your your building for developers to expose it to them instead yes. of just keeping because you want you. to empower them. You don't want to just like like mysteriously fail and like not give them the information that they need. Then it also means like you also like okay, let's say I have like a giant JSON dump uh, yeah. in, a file in, in my file system. I need a uh, like a Almost, almost like a honeycomb client to just connect to that, and then just yeah. like help the help the user figure it out on their own. You know, mm-hmm. um, so that's that's where I'm at in terms of like I think the the option. Yeah. Is to develop, develop, I don't know. <laughs> there are so many uses for this sort of stuff. It's really a mindset more than anything. It's a mindset of of wanting your tools and your code and your systems to explain themselves to you, right? Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's that's all the questions I had. Um, you know, I I was thinking that I would go um, get a production like front end app um, and yeah. like add some of these ideas. And I, I actually I did not know that Honeycomb had a free tier. Um, yeah. It was actually hard to find the pricing page. I was like, I know. Uh, oh, this is one of those right contact really contact hard. sales. Well, no, it's good. It's good. If you have the image of like, in order to, to get to buy us, you have to talk to us first, and like it's going to be you know dollar dollar dollar. We're trying to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> but there, if there's a if there's a free edition, I might just like instrument that up and, and put it in there and just right. like get get front end developers. And you should uh, be able to just like install the the JavaScript beeline, and that should do 
almost everything right. for you. What, what is a you beeline? Do, I, I heard you mention this. It's like, yeah. like, it's like the new Relic integrations, that sort of thing. Okay. They're open source. And what they do is like all that stuff where I was talking about how when the request enters the service, you initialize an empty event and then you pre-populate it with everything you know about the request and any parameters, you know, and then at the end, uh, before it errors or exits, you ship it off to Honeycomb in one blob. It does all of that for you. The only gotcha. thing that you want to do is after installing the um, Beeline, you, you could probably make a visual pass through your code and look for any important IDs or anything that, you know, because we'll, we'll magically, like, any queries, you know, requests, HTTP requests, we, we wrap those and, and bundle them. But, like, if you have important variables, then you can just do, like, a, basically a printf to just stuff them into the blob, too, because we can't automatically do all that. So you just, like, stuff any important variables into the Honeycomb blob, and then everything is um, are automatically wrapped up in the, in the right format. Yeah, sounds, sounds awesome. I think it's, yeah, it's a lot of data structures and just, like, trying to it make is. it as well, useful It is. Well, we're trying to make it self. very easy so that you don't have to think about any of that. You just install the library, and everything's pretty magical. Well, for what it's worth, that's that's I I like that because then I actually have a good oh, okay. model of of what I'm what I'm doing right like, um, it, it demystifies the black box a little bit. Good. We're we're actually like I was talking to the people who do the maintain maintaining of these, and we're gonna make it so that there's a mode that you can use the beelines in, where it just instead of shipping it to Honeycomb, it runs it like in plain text, so it'll output the events, so you can ship them into anything that you want. And nice. I think this will be awesome because then it will like decouple it. So if you don't want to use Honeycomb for whatever reason, but you still want to instrument for observability, you can still use our integrations. And I'm really stoked about that because I don't want, you know, it's so much more important to me that people learn how to build observable systems and software. Like I want Honeycomb to succeed, but that's like secondary to me. Like <laughs> I've seen <laughs> like impact that it has in people's lives. And like, it's really important to me that engineers learn how to do this because it makes building system so much better. So I want people to be able to use the, this kind of instrumentation even if they aren't using it. Yeah. But yes, we do have well, a free tier and it, it's <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think, I think a, a front-end developers will have a lot to learn from, from thinking about this and adding this to the toolkit. Like it's, it's, just, it's one of the things that we should have uh, to think yes. about when we, when we put apps together. I really um, look forward to whatever you yeah. write about this. I can't wait. That's awesome. Well, thanks for thanks for schooling me and thanks for uh, the education uh, on, on Twitter <laughs> and, uh, on, on this on this call. Thanks for receiving um, it. <laughs>